All right, good morning. Uh, I'm gonna get started here. Uh, welcome to our workshop on mechanical seal reliability and troubleshooting. Uh, I'm gonna be your presenter today. Uh, my name is Brian Calfer and I'm the uh, Senior Regional Engineering Manager uh, with John Crane. I'm based here in uh, Pasadena, Texas. Um, with John Crane for 20 years now, um, responsibility including uh, just engineering oversight and support for our North America region within John Crane, which is US and Canada. Uh, been heavily involved in training the both uh, end users and John Crane personnel, uh, supporting both mechanical seal application and, and, and troubleshooting efforts. Um, currently a member of the uh, Texas A&M International uh, Pump Users Advisory Committee and the API 682 Task Force that's working on uh, the fifth edition currently. So uh, pretty good and detailed project. Uh, and I'm a BSME mechanical engineering from Drexel University in uh, Philadelphia. So what we're gonna discuss today is uh, just talking about mechanical seal reliability, uh, the troubleshooting process, and, and really just, in, in my opinion, these are just kind of good practice, nuts and bolts, uh, things that we should be mindful of in consideration when we when we look at problematic applications or, or problematic seals and, and then just kind of you know bigger picture what's what's the process what's kind of the things that we need to be mindful of and, and ensuring that we're progressing down that mental checklist um, when we're looking to resolve some issues that were faced uh, in the field. So briefly, when we're looking at mechanical seal reliability, in essence, I mean, there, there's some really good examples here um, you know, that we can say, to say the least, the environment that the mechanical seal is going to operate in is very challenging. And when we consider the overall impact to the reliability of the me mechanical seal, it's really important to understand um, that specific environment that the seal is operating in. In other words, the seal chamber or the cavity where that seal is installed. Um, typically it's a pump, could be in a compressor, could be in any number of industrial machines, but the conditions within that cavity which the seal is gonna operate are key to understanding the, the potential for success and potential for issues that that seal is gonna incur over its life. Uh, the operating conditions of the equipment are, are variable to be sure, but specifically, Focusing on temperatures and pressures within that cavity uh, that the seal is installed in is, is critical to understand. And when we look at those localized conditions, uh, we can really kind of magnify or amplify extremes of maybe volatility in the process itself. So if you understand the seal environment, how to control it and condition it to the best of our ability, then you know that's really where we start to focus on improvements to the reliability of mechanical seal. So when we're talking about the environment, we want to know temperature changes, pressure changes. Uh, obviously, if the fluid's going to change state, uh, when we talk about ethylene, for example, any kind of rapid drop in pressure is going to definitely going to result in some fairly significant temperature changes. So uh, being mindful of that, uh, really gives us a better understanding of, of how we need to approach the application and, and also uh, troubleshoot it on the back end. So changing state of the fluid is a, is a big concern. It's, uh, it's a concern in, in ethylene services. It's a concern in, in many hydrocarbon services and refineries as well, but even in uh, in some other streams, uh, the actual changing state of that fluid is uh, something to be mindful of and we concern ourselves with as, as seal suppliers, uh, certainly in the application stage. Uh, when we talk about changing state, uh, an example of say hot hybrid hydrocarbon leakage uh, passing across mechanical seal faces, uh, it's gonna coke as that fluid partially burns or vaporizes. So you're gonna leave hard surface deposits there. Uh, liquefied gases, they're going to freeze the vapor in the air, uh, and that can in turn create seal problems. Uh, we can even look at some stages where it could actually freeze localized components such as O-rings and elastomers. So uh, we, we keep that in consideration when we look at the, the overall design of the seal. Uh, 
certainly that's going to potentially create hang up and prevent functionality of the seal itself. You know, if we consider those, you know, dangerous fluids, if we look at maybe less dangerous or less volatile fluids, they may still experience a change in phase, um, but it's not likely to be as severe, but we still have to look at uh, in terms of the scope of the reliability, nobody wants an unreliable seal. So that's uh, state change is, is still going to be something that, uh, to be mindful of. So even in this uh, condition of, say, seawater or brine, you're still going to have that crystallization and drying out uh, from, from the heat with the contacting surfaces. So, you, so you'll still have adhered deposits uh, that you need to be uh, contending with uh, to help prolong the life of the seal. So when we look at mechanical seal reliability, it's important to understand some of the, the definitions in terms of what we're trying to achieve and then you know diagnosing that uh, as well. So the purpose of a mechanical seal is we're preventing the passage of liquid gas vapor or any solids, uh, usually to atmosphere, uh, but maybe also to other stages of, of the pumping process. So. In the simplest sense, we can consider a mechanical seal to be a controlled leakage device. And so therefore seal failure is gonna be associated with what's unacceptable leakage. And that's really gonna vary from the product being sealed and also from the industry and uh, the end user. So oftentimes that's, that's specifying or, or, or requiring, requiring a seal for that piece of equipment. Um, so if we look at water, for example, water or aqueous applications, uh, they're not necessarily going to present a threat to the environment. Um, so visible leakage quantified in a volumetric rate, such as milliliters per hour, or in a mass leakage rate, such as grams per hour, uh, really may not be severe. Um, but we may need to consider uh, the totality of the leakage and, and still comply with existing standards or, or even published government regulations that's going to define uh, or determine those allowable leakage or emission levels. Many end users still have their own specifications related to the process, um, and they're just strictly in, in, imposed to ensure not only plant safety, but a lot of times product quality as well. And, and, and quite frankly, there's some end users that will accept, can't accept any leakage. Um, and we can say that's a no visible leakage policy or, or almost a zero leakage policy. And in, in which case, uh, that practice of saying maybe three drops per minute, which is kind of a, a, an understood industry rule, uh, that could be considered a major leak in, in some in some cases. So um, obviously, it's going to depend on the volatility of the process itself. Uh, and then we have to look at additional layers of containment and leakage management, uh, depending on both the environmental restrictions in place uh, and then plant standards and, and, and regulations that apply. So the user can really, uh, really to understand is that the, the user of the equipment oftentimes really determines what's acceptable uh, and what's not acceptable in terms of the leakage from the mechanical seal and ultimately the seal performance. Mechanical seals has a finite life, which means they're going to be need to be replaced at some point. Um, so that's really kind of a key thing to remember is all seals leak and all seals will eventually fail. I mean, they are, they are a finite uh, component that, with a finite life. So eventually that's going to need to be contended with. And what happens when that occurs in terms of where does that leakage go? How do we main, how do we contain it? Uh, that really needs to be kind of understood uh, by all parties uh, when that equipment is specced out and that seal is applied. Uh, seals, they rarely fail suddenly unless there are, um, you know, ex other extending, cir extenuating circumstances. There are usually symptoms which lead up to a failure. Uh, and, and what we kind of want to gear our heads to as this presentation goes on is, is how we can go about and look at maybe some of 
uh, the other considerations to consider in terms of the symptoms that will impact uh, the seal performance. So even though some mechanical seals will have a short life and they fail maybe within a few days or weeks, um, obviously that's not acceptable. That's considered a premature failure. Uh, you know, they could be associated with maybe assembly or build of the seal or installation. Uh, and a lot of times it could be installation or even operational issues that are that are kind of contributing to that. But most mechanical seals will typically remain in service between six to 12 months. Uh, others report, perform reliably for several years. It's not common uh, for mechanical seals to really be replaced because they've simply just worn out. Um, they're really gonna be in the minority in that aspect. It's really something that's going to uh, impact or shorten the life of the seal before it gets to that point. So th this is a, an interesting kind of summarization of, of data from a couple different sources that are listed at the bottom of the slide here. Um, and really this study was you know, conducted across different process plants, mainly oil refineries and, and chemical plants as well. Um, and that the kind of the summary of these studies is that mechanical seals kind of attributed to the cause of between 36 to 75 percent of the equipment failures. In other words, that's what uh, that equipment was written up for was a seal leak or undesirable seal leak. Um, but when you look at it now that the problems with the actual seal design really were only up to 24 percent of those failures. So uh, out of that bigger number, say 75 percent. Uh, you had about roughly 50% of it that was attributed to other factors. Um, most of the seals in, uh, in the course of these studies, uh, when they failed, they failed kind of prematurely and only about 10% actually made it to a, a condition where we can say they actually, they actually wore out where the, the faces wore to the point where they could no longer uh, provide a good seal of the process. Uh, up to 50% of the mechanical seals operated for roughly three years. This number is probably, in my opinion, is probably going to have increased over time with uh, more and more adoption of uh, standardized practices and, and like API 610 and 682 uh, for specifically for mechanical seals. Uh, so I think that number would, would has probably increased some uh, if this study were be done today. Uh, some seals will still survive for in excess of 10 years. And that's, again, still not uncommon uh, as technology and material improvements uh, in sealing technology come more and more uh, prevalent into the industry. But the key kind of takeaway here is that the actual seal design and selection is really in the minority of contributing causes of, of seal failures tip, and, and specifically undesirable seal leakage. So, Typically, we need to look uh, further into the application to determine root causes. And that kind of leads us into uh, the failure analysis or observation analysis uh, kind of mindset. And, and so certainly when we're considering equipment reliability and principally the mechanical seal uh, reliability, following a failure, we really want to obtain necessary related data to that failure. And if we're objective and aware of this information, uh, we should be on a right path to resolution. And we want to consider, you know, several points when we're looking at relevant data to the application. Uh, considering that process pumps often don't run continuously, um, they can really lead into uncertainty about actual cumulative operating time, the number of start stops which occur. Uh, all of this information is helpful to understand the seal performance criteria and evaluating the seal reliability uh, overall when we look at that specific failure. Any of the data that we acquire in relation to the duty parameters, uh, such as the temperature, pressure, um, speed, et cetera, they, they, they prove helpful. Uh, when we investigate and try to identify uh, root causes of failure. During the pump operation, if there's any transients 
uh, that we can kind of identify, including short-term fluctuations, changes in pressure and temperature. Uh, remember, I talked about the environment of the seal and any kind of changes in that environment can really magnify issues. So if we have a transient kind of vapor phase or gas pocket that causes vaporization, especially with a volatile fluid such as ethylene, uh, even when we look at higher or lower temperatures or higher temperatures or lower pressures, uh, again, those localized kind of transients, especially in, within the seal chamber, can be, can be magnified and, and uh, be impacting the reliability. Vibration is, is uh, certainly a big uh, factor uh, when we look at mechanical seals. Uh, it can occur due to impeller wear. Uh, operating the pump outside of optimum design efficiency or you know, outside of the BEP or best efficiency point on the performance curve. Uh, and certainly this could uh, cause problems with the seals and the, and the bearings as well, especially if you look at uh, the age of your equipment. Uh, if it's a, an older pre, I'll say pre eighth edition API pump, there's going to be uh, potentially some magnified issues with operation to far left or far right of BEP in terms of hydraulic induced issues in terms of shaft deflections and, and, and other and other issues. So vibration and again tying back into operation of the equipment, operational data uh, really is key in understanding the big picture here. Uh, and then finally we can look at the mechanical seal and objectively say is this the correct seal for the service and in some cases it may not be suitable sometimes uh, process conditions has changed there may be uh, variants introduced to the stream that weren't there before and we have to look at material compatibility uh, face pressures temperatures speed capability um, so it's good to take an objective look at the seal uh, especially in a high visibility or repeat failure situation and, and make sure it's still suitable for the application. And, and, and that's not to say that uh, we won't find issues with the seal that we can maybe improve upon, but uh, that's, that should always just be one piece of the puzzle and not the, you know, the first path of resolution is let's change the seal. We got to make sure that we have the big picture defined uh, before we go about implementing changes. So I've kind of harped on the point a little bit up till now, but uh, bears repeating that there's multiple factors that are gonna impact the performance of the mechanical seal. And so once that seal is installed into the equipment, it becomes part of the system in which that equipment is installed. So every impact from the system that the equipment can be effectively impacted by it is most likely gonna be transferred to the mechanical seal, I think. Many have heard an often used analogy that the seal is just a fuse in the system and therefore its failure is typically not indicative of poor design. And that really holds true. Uh, something else has, has usually impacted the seal to shorten the life. So what we have here are just some examples shown that are common factors that we wanna kind of be mindful of. And this really summarizes what I talked about in the previous slide. Uh, it really gives you kind of a, a little checklist in terms of evaluation. Uh, of mechanical seal failure when you start undergoing any troubleshooting efforts. It's good to consider one, if not all these physical conditions uh, that impact the performance of the seal. Uh, in my experience, no matter how elaborate the seal design, internal misalignment between the seal and equipment often really contributes to a lot of these issues. So these internal alignment checks that we're, we'll discuss a little bit uh, they really need to be kind of verified at each maintenance interval, especially when the seal is replaced. A lot of times they're not, um, and again, in, in my experience, um, that can really shorten the life of the seal and, and usually contributes in one form or another to uh, degraded performance. So one of the main factors that influences mechanical seal reliability is gonna be lubrication. And so it's it, it's no secret that all seals are gonna, uh, all seals will leak. All seals leak because they need fluid at the faces uh, for lubrication. So some mechanical seal designs operate uh, as dry seals with a gas barrier. 
um, but they're still going to re require, uh, in that case, they're using specialized phase technology to uh, be lubricated with a gas film uh, instead of a liquid, but still lubrication is required. Uh, majority of mechanical seals are going to use good liquid lubrication between the seal faces in order pr to provide satisfactory performance. Any instance where you have poorly lubricated seal faces, you're going to result in an increased uh, friction condition, increased temperatures, and ultimately deterioration of the seal faces. Uh, subsequently, your secondary elements, such as your elastomers that are in contact with the seal rings can suffer thermal degradation uh, with those localized conditions and particularly where the surface contact occurs, any additional heat generated by phase friction is gonna get transferred uh, right to the elastomer. So this is critical because we talk about volatile hydrocarbons and hydrocarbon processing and you have to, con you have to contain the phase change and some fluid uh, two things happen at seal faces. We have pressure drop and temperatures increasing and, and both of those conditions are, are ripe for increasing phase change. So we can, we can certainly take measures in the design of the seal to ensure we have uh, adequate lubrication while minimizing leakage. And we look at uh, different materials, we look at different uh, face technologies or treatments to help promote lubrication, minimize wear and heat. Um, but it, then it all gets back to the transients, the upsets, uh, the var the variables that will that may push uh, those seal faces uh, outside of a, a boundary where uh, acceptable limits are, are going to be maintained. So uh, we look at all the operating conditions and, and again the environment of the seal and how does that in turn impact uh, the lubrication and the lubrication conditions uh, for those seal faces. So hang up, uh, when we look at uh, post failure analysis or, or, or performance analysis of mechanical seals, hang up is certainly uh, going to be very critical and, and definitely will impact pusher seals uh, more than non-pusher designs. Pusher seals are, are going to have a an elastomer secondary element that's need to, that needs to move axially or slide, uh, and if that sliding elastomer is prevented from axial movement, uh, the seal face leakage uh, is, is definitely going to be elevated at that point. So, uh, most sliding elements uh, typically is going to be elastomer O-rings. Uh, er, in early on, it was it was maybe a wedge design. They're they're less prevalent now, but you may still come across those. Uh, in either case, those elastomer elements uh, may hang up due to deposits or accumulation uh, from what's coming across the seal faces. So, if we look at the pictures here, this is in a nepheline seal, a ligamer deposit formation uh, on the atmospheric side of, of a seal. And, and this was, again, results to a couple of things, uh, higher elevated levels of leakage, and then also localized conditions where seal face temperatures were running uh, much hotter than anticipated. So uh, in, in this case, it was problem was corrected by uh, adjusting some parameters in the seal faces, uh, uh, improving uh, implementing a little different face technology to lower temperatures uh, and improve lubricity. And so that cut down quite a bit on um, the localized temperatures, but there was also some process related uh, operational issues here as, as well in terms of start stops uh, that was potentially contributing to uh, the condition that you see here. So we're talking about conditioning the environment of the seal, and, and I've mentioned that a few times. What we're really discussing is, is the support system uh, or the piping plan. So uh, piping plans are, 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 are critical to improving and maximizing the life of the mechanical seal. Um, 
really kind of the the default to look at is uh, an international standard such as API 682. Uh, the seal piping plans are well defined in API 682. And the expectation is you provide that uh, a suitable environment for the seal that you achieve a, a, a certain life and in roughly three years, but a little over three years if you look at it in, in service hour intervals. Uh, so we look at piping plans, both on single and dual seal arrangements. And the purpose of any piping plan is to provide a controlled fluid, fluid environment for the application. So some plans include heat exchangers to remove heat generated by the seal. Uh, and then that, and that supplied cooled fluid is back into the seal. So this is all about controlling, we talked about phase change. So reducing the temperature in the seal chamber actually helps uh, reduce the the volatility. So you know this is one way we can approach it. We can we can look at increasing pressure, or we can reduce temperature to improve uh, or decrease the potential for that fluid to now vaporize and and, and change phase. Uh, in some cases, we may be concerned about abrasives, so we look at filtration or strainer, or cyclone separator to help remove particulate, remove abrasives. Uh, in some cases, we may remove that fluid as a lubricant for the seal altogether. Again, ties it back to lubrication and conditioning the fluid uh, that the seal is going to, to operate in. Uh, we may say this fluid is, is too volatile, uh, too abrasive, what have you, too, too dangerous to even come across the seal faces and potentially get to atmosphere. Again, all seals fail, all seals are gonna leak. Uh, so we may provide a pressurized, barrier system and a dual seal that now completely isolates the process. So again, it's, it's, it's the thought of conditioning uh, the system or conditioning the environment for the seal to give you the best chance of optimum reliability. Uh, and that's selecting that proper support system is important uh, to achieve the, the best reliability out of the seal. So I'll just talk a little bit about Plan 23 because it it, it is a good example just to um, highlight some some things we discussed. And so this image here is just a kind of a, a typical example Plan 23 arrangement. Um, there are certainly variations of this, but uh, this right now is showing a heat exchanger uh, positioned horizontally. It could be mounted vertically. This is showing a, a heat exchanger with that's uh, water cooled. There can be air cooled heat exchangers as well, uh, but this is just kind of a typical example. And you know, Plan 23, we would traditionally use it on hot water service and hydrocarbons above uh, roughly 60 C or 140 F. Uh, and what this does is it allows the seal environment to be conditioned and operate lower than the pump product temperature. So this will allow us to have a uh, good application and a good environment for the mechanical seal by lowering uh, the temperature within the seal chamber. And then, you know, obviously for those fluids that are close to their vapor pressure point, uh, moving them away from that. Uh, so the amount of heat that's removed with the Plan 23 is really dependent on the design of the heat exchanger. Uh, and in, in addition, positioning and orientation, uh, together with uh, some type of optimized internal circulation device, which is a pumping ring is often the industry term for that, uh, is really determines the effectiveness of removing the heat generated by the, by the mechanical seal. Now, because this is a closed system, uh, it, even though it can be very, very reliable, we have to be mindful of uh, potential pitfalls with it. And one of those is to ensure that you have a, a good mechanism for, for vent, venting vapors out of the seal chamber. So what we see here is we have a uh, piping from our exchanger or a reservoir going to our exchanger. Uh, and the orientation of this piping is, is leaving us with a potential for a vapor pocket in the seal chamber. And so if that vapor pocket isn't evacuated, then 
uh, as the shaft starts turning, all the kind of liquid will get kind of centrifuged to the out in, outside and that vapor pocket will tend to kind of hug the shaft, which happens to be where our seal faces are. So we get dry running again, poor lubrication condition. So uh, in order to prevent that, we would have to manually vent this. Uh, another way to, to ensure uh, that we get good liquid at the seal face and start up is to maybe, you know, pipe it a different way. Uh, this is a different orientation where you're actually promoting self-venting of that cavity at startup. So, you know, this is part of the process of that mental checklist to go down uh, and look at the orientation of the piping. You know, is is this piping conducive for to self-venting? If it's not, do we have mechanisms to manually vent it? Um, and I've seen some plan 23s where there are manual vent valves um, and they're kind of at, at grade level. And, and I would not expect anyone to kind of crack open manual vent valves on a, on a high pressure boiler feed pump, um, you know, if that's not safe, safely being able to be done. So, you know, you have to look at those valves. Can they be vented? Um, and can they be vented safely? And, you know, so you look at that in, in, in the bigger picture and, you know, maybe there's some uh, different engineering controls and administrative controls that you put in to, to ensure that process gets done. Or you, or you look at uh, porting and piping to see if, uh, if that can be done uh, through natural means. And so that's what we're showing here. Uh, so again, it's just more, it's, it's, it's more of the kind of thought process involved in the, in the troubleshooting. Uh, to making sure you're you're addressing all these factors uh, when you look at the application. So when we consider a failed seal, um, really it's going to be due to undesirable or unacceptable leakage. Uh, so the image in the in the picture here, I, I believe, is really just a, a packing example. It's not a it's not a seal. Um, but you can see, you know, certainly walking up to a pump and seeing this, you would know that that, that is not acceptable uh, for performance out of your mechanical seal. Uh, so when we look at a failed seal, there's may not always be physical damage to help identify the reason for failure, but there's usually some kind of visible, visible clue or damage to say it's caused by either mechanical issues, chemical attack, thermal damage, you know, component wear, what have you. Uh, mechanical problems can be caused from the incorrect seal assembly or installation. Uh, we could develop excessive hydraulic pressure that's going to result in face distortion, secondary uh, seal extrusion, erosion due to high velocity in certain areas around the seal. So that's something that we look at in the analysis, uh, particularly if you have abrasive particles present in the fluid itself. Uh, face contact wear, uh, if it's more severe is really going to tell us that there's insufficient uh, hydrodynamic fluid film support. So that's a fancy way of me saying not a lot of lubrication at the seal faces or inadequate lubrication at the seal faces. And, and, and we have to identify uh, why that is and if there's any uh, measures or steps that we can take to correct that. Chemical damage to hardware is usually some form of corrosion, but it can be localized pitting or, or crevice corrosion, such as under dynamic O-rings. Uh, if we have non-compatible materials selected, then chemical attack can occur to the elastomers, the resins, or even the metal impregnations and the carbons itself. Uh, and even some of the binders and some of the carbide seal rings can, can be susceptible to that as well. Thermal damage that we see at the seal face uh, is typically going to be in the form of heat checking, blistering, polymerization deposits between the seal faces. Uh, with hydrocarbons, you have potentially you have the uh, possibility of coking deposits causing problems with hang up. Uh, and, and even in the uh, ethylene example with uh, the oligomer breakdown due to heat or, or the conditions are, are suitable to support that at the seal faces. Uh, that can, you know, kind of be left behind and, and give hang-up issues, uh, lead to hang-up issues as well. Some examples here of, of, of edge chipping, and these would be kind of the areas we would look at in terms of clues as to what occurred or, or what's potentially uh, contributing to uh, the, the reduced performance of the seal. So the edge chipping can occur either 
at the inside or outside edge of the seal face, usually caused by uh, some kind of physical duress thawing service. Uh, so the distress thawing service, it can be result, resultant from cavitation, vibration, shaft deflections, or, or overheating and vaporization of the fluid. Uh, particularly with flashing hydrocarbons at, at their vapor point. So fluids such as ethylene, for example, are gonna kind of possibly flash or pop um, as that seal fluid occurs as it crosses the seal face. So uh, any mechanical seals having misaligned faces. So we're talking about, uh, this is getting into that seal and equipment relationship. Um, Internal misalignment can really kind of contribute and lead to a lot of this as well. So edge chipping, particularly higher speeds applications, um, if the hydraulic closing forces on, on the seal face are unable to compensate uh, for those out of alignment conditions, then you really have difficulty maintaining uh, good closing force on the seal faces and, and ultimately you, you get higher leakage, uh, but you may see uh, wear signs in terms of different uh, edge chipping and wear on the faces that we will, will give us an indication of what caused that. And if it was related uh, to equipment seal internal misalignment, then those are the checks we need to ensure get done uh, to, to rule those out or to correct them if necessary. And so this is what I was talking about earlier that a lot of times these, these checks may get missed or they may get uh, you know, not not that they get brushed off, but I've heard many times, oh, we oh, we checked it last time; it was good, or or no, that's not an issue. Uh, even if it is good, we we, we want to see the numbers and we want to know uh, what the actual readings are. So, you know, these are just some of the uh, of the checks that we're talking about, uh, particular, and these are these are kind of the bigger ones that are going to impact the life of your seal. So, your angular misalignment shown here, or your perpendicularity. Uh, is another term for this. Uh, I had the picture on the right is, is showing you how you would go about checking this with a dial indicator. Um, if the angular misalignment is, is out of tolerance, you're ex essentially looking at a condition that you shown on the left, you know, magnified example, but you have to visualize is that uh, green component, which is our, our primary seal face is now rotating with our shaft. Uh, the wear against that mating ring is going to be very uneven um, and potentially give us some edge chipping at the OD, which you can kind of visualize by looking at the, the picture there. So in terms of a threshold, if we default to API, for example, a half a thou per inch of the bore is a good place to start uh, in terms of a good standard to adopt. Rotating seal heads, uh, for example, are going to be very susceptible to angular misalignment wear. So if, if that green element is rotating with the shaft and the shaft is now, you know, not perpendicular to that stationary component anymore, you're going to get that a lot of the edge chipping going on and, and uneven wear. If we make that seal head stationary uh, and it's not rotating with the shaft, it's now able to... Um, essentially flex once because that's typically going to be our spring loaded member that seal head uh, if that's stationary that'll flex maybe one time uh, with the shaft rotation and, and then kind of run in that position so uh, if we sus suspect angular misalignment uh, you know we can look at orientation of the seal and maybe go from a rotating seal head to a stationary seal head to help uh, take up or offset some of that uh, some of those issues Now on the flip side of that, we can be perpendicular misaligned, perpendicularly misaligned, or we can also have parallel misalignment or concentricity being off. Uh, and so now this is looking at the shaft being concentric to the bore uh, of the mechanical of, of the of the equipment where that seal is installed. So we want to limit the TIR, the total indicator run out to about five thousandths of five thousandths of an inch maximum. Uh, if we have a, a high degree of parallel offset, that seal head now is, is not running true. It's actually running off of 
that corresponding seal face and you get the wear track. Uh, you can see in the picture on the mating ring on the bottom what that wear track looks like. It's, it's very uneven, it's not concentric anymore. Uh, so you may see some, some ID chipping, edge chipping as well here. Uh, if this is, uh, and you see eccentricities in the wear track, this is something you need to kind of investigate and, and, and chase down. So while stationary seal heads would, would be really good for the perpendicularity, if you have a stationary seal head uh, design and you have a lot of parallel misalignment, uh, that's gonna get magnified uh, more in that instance, you're gonna have more distress in that instance is now that stationary seal head is gonna to wanna to try to track around and follow that mating ring uh, and you could potentially lead to uh, higher wear, or higher leakage uh, in that case. So really that resolution is you try to, you need to address uh, the concentricity uh, issues if they are present and, you know, dowling uh, bearing housings, having a good fit on your, uh, repeatability and in, in, in your support of your bearings and your, of your shaft, uh, all those are, are, are kind of good practices to look at, but it all starts with uh, doing the checks and, and doing the due, due diligence to make sure uh, you're eliminating those issues if they are there. So this is a little bit of an exaggerated example, but that's in essence what you'd be looking at if you're if you have a lot of uh, in play in your shaft. So uh, you really shouldn't have any more than uh, it, considering a typical ball type thrust bearing. You shouldn't have any more than than five thousandths total, probably less than that. Uh, obviously, if you had a tilt pad style bearing, you're going to have more potential play in the shaft. The the important thing is we don't want um, what's being depicted in the left-hand side diagram to be occurring um, consistently. If, I mean, if you have some uh, axial movement of the seal, if that's a, you know, a transient growth or, or, or at startup, most mechanical seals can take a certain amount of, of transient movement. Uh, but we don't want obviously this situation occurring where we're having, you know, the rotor shuttling or moving axially with, you know, with every shaft rotation, because we're going to not only have higher leakage, we'll, we'll potentially degrade secondary elements, we'll have a lot of uh, face wear. Uh, and so this is important to, to really understand, uh, again, going back to the installation that the, that we're starting from a good base and a good foundation in terms of uh, the platform for that seal to be installed in. So another uh, area that we focus on, and when we talk about the, the bigger picture of liability is the elastomers uh, or secondary sealing elements. There's various documents uh, that you can read and, and find describing, you know, visual, visual effects of elastomer failure. Uh, there you're going to include things, mechanical damage, such as cuts or nicks, uh, usually occurs during assembly or installation of the seal, compression set, thermal degradation, extrusion, chemical deterioration, or, or rapid gas decompression. So you, uh, even all the various elastomer manufacturers have, have actually pretty good information uh, concerning these types of, of wear modes and, and, and also capabilities of their specific elastomers. Uh, if we look at one specific example, the rapid gas decompression, especially as it applies to uh, very light fluids under high pressure, uh, I think that's a good one to, to discuss. Uh, if we look at uh, this slide, and, and uh, this is a really, really interesting uh, progression. Uh, looking at essentially real time of, of rapid gas decompression. So your elastomer elements, they're, they're permeable. And so under pressure, the gases are gonna penetrate into that structure. Um, so rapid gas decompression, or you'll hear RGD, you'll hear explosive decompression, they're all kind of talking the same, meaning the same thing, is, is essentially a condition is that occurs when the high pressure gas that's absorbed into that elastomer eternal structure uh, rapidly expands. And that usually happens because of, of a rapid drop in pressure. 
And so that compressed gas trapped within those O-ring pores expands and it has to equalize to, to equalize the external pressure. And so what you're seeing here is microscope in images of elastomer that's exposed to hydrogen gas at about uh, 100 bar, 1450 uh, PSI. And it goes from, if we look at the top going from A down to H, A is during pressurization uh, and then B is during decompression and then C is roughly you know, right after decompression. Uh, D is one minute decompression, E is two minutes, and then it goes so on three, four, and five minutes. And so you can see as, as it goes, you know, even though that gas is, uh, that pressure is rapidly taken away, what happens to those expanding gas bubbles uh, during that resultant time after decompression. And it's pretty interesting to see. And, and what happens is your, your, your end result is gonna be uh, pretty severe in terms of uh, the damage that's caused to that secondary element. So uh, if the volume of trap gas is small, you know, you may have surface blisters that recede as the pressure equalizes, and you may not have any permanent damage to, to the surface of the elastomer itself. You may still notice some, you know, degradation in overall performance. Uh, but typically when you have a larger volume of gas that's trapped within that structure, it can't escape fast enough. And that's likely to cause, you know, substantial damage like you see here. So all of these are just different, differing degrees of damage from RGD with cracks to surface blisters to ruptures. Um, sometimes the damage is not obvious and you have to actually section or, or cut the O-ring uh, to see it. And you'll typically see those uh, kind of splits in the structure itself. Uh, and that'll tell you, at least give you a, a, an example or, or an idea indication of what's occurring. So uh, typically to present, prevent this, we have to look at what caused that rapid pressurization or that rapid phase change in the first place. Sometimes we may have to look at um, a higher durometer elastomer or maybe even a, an alternative secondary sealing design uh, like an energized polymer seal or something along those lines. If we look at the hardware of the seal, um, right, what we're looking at right here is a uh, pitting corrosion example. Uh, we'll consider corrosion when we, just for the basis of this uh, discussion, but pitting corrosion is one of the more destructive forms. Uh, and that's generally what we see on the surface of materials like stainless steel or aluminum. Uh, and those materials with you know, they have that protective passive oxide film. As that's broken down, that's where you get the kind of initiation uh, and initiates that corrosion mechanism. So it can be more severe, uh, the general surface corrosion, but it may only penetrate a relatively small surface area, uh, but then that corrodes deeper within uh, the surface at that point. So uh, concentra concentrated corrosion, for example, in a, in a metal bellow seal where you have uh, relatively thin uh, cross-section metal plates, um, that can kind of, this type of corrosion can basically rapidly perforate uh, through those thin wall sections. So we have to look at the metallurgy, the material of the bellows at that point, and, and to determine if that's really uh, a, a cause of failure. The rate of penetration can be somewhere, I believe from 10 to 100 times that of general corrosion. And it's, it's usually difficult to determine how much has taken place. Um, if it's bad enough, we may have to actually measure uh, the weight loss of the component. In other words, check the density compared to a new part to determine how much corrosion has occurred. It can be that. Uh, kind of tricky to determine. Uh, but what, you know, this is just, again, part of the process to uh, come to resolution if, we, if we're faced with issues. So these are just uh, some examples of some uh, shapes, different types of corrosion in terms of, uh, you know, it could be narrow, wide, deep, shallow, or regular. Um, you know, materials that are available uh, to improve the resistance, you know, most typically 
we're going to use stainless steel uh, 316 Austin X stainless steel. Um, it has the addition of molybdenum, which improves the pitting resistance, uh, especially if, if chlorides are, are, are available. Um, some more severe applications can be, uh, can really like seawater, for example, can really uh, accelerate uh, the pitting corrosion. So we may look at uh, duplex stainless steel or super duplex in some cases, uh, if we have to really kind of uh, be mindful of, of mitigating effects uh, of this type of wear and breakdown. So overall, if we look at uh, metallurgy and different kind of component, you know, makeup mechanical seal, you know, one thing to consider is now the overall design and that's the overall design of, of the equipment itself and the mechanical seal and, and designing to industry standards. So, uh, talking about API 610, uh, international standards for, for centrifugal pumps, petroleum, petrochemical, natural gas industry, uh, that provides some reference to the mechanical seal. And then API 682 specifically on fourth edition now, and you know, I mentioned we're working on the fifth edition uh, of that standard to be released in, in, a few, in next year or so. Uh, this helps with identifying requirements, uh, good baseline requirements, in my opinion, for mechanical seal support system uh, that's going to comply with uh, good industry standard and, and, and yield the best performance, uh, best chance for reliability for the mechanical seal in a, in a specific application. So just one example, um, you know, looking at fourth edition and, and looking at clearances within uh, a seal chamber here. So previously a minimum radial clearance was uh, about an eighth of an inch or three millimeters was specified between our rotating components and, and the seal chamber bore. And that's really to allow sufficient fluid lubrication and circulation. And so this is apply in all sizes. Um, the exception is gonna be made around pumping ring clearances and flow diverters and things of that nature. Uh, but on smaller pumps, the radial clearance is, is a little more difficult to achieve. So, you know, in fourth edition, it considered, for example, size range and relates clearances to those pumps used both in 610 and also ASME B73. So your ANSI pumps as well. So uh, the intention is now you're actually taking what's considered maybe a good design practice and trying to apply that across different industries, both API 610 equipment and ANSI equipment as well. And so the, the intent of that increased clearance is to ensure that you don't have any contact uh, between components. And then it's also to really to ensure you get uh, good circulation, good cooling for the seal itself. Uh, and so this, I mean, you know, this is kind of a, a pretty simplistic example, but it's one way that you can look at kind of an industry practice and say, you know, are we adopting that? Are we following that? And, and maybe that's something, you know, we can implement that doesn't necessarily take a lot of, uh, you know, investment potentially, but uh, can actually help improve reliability uh, of, of a problematic service. Uh, this is just another example, looking at some kind of good practices here, uh, specifically in regard to the sleeves. Uh, looking at the sleeve of the mechanical seal, you know, anywhere that uh, the shaft could be damaged by removing the set screws, you try to relieve that area to help facilitate uh, seal removal. And that's shown by that recess here in the diagram. Um, minimum thicknesses of the sleeves, this helps uh, with distortion, this helps uh, in integrity. You don't want to have a, uh, you know, when you have a minimum thickness under a set screw, for example, and you tighten that set screw down like your, your seal head shown here. Uh, we don't want to deform or deflect that sleeve. And so all these are and all these are just some examples of some good practices around just the sleeve itself. And then you can kind of now picture the, the breadth of that standard having uh, much more involvement in just into the overall design of the seal. And then also kind of some good practices for the equipment and the application itself.
Uh, so just to kind of wrap it up, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things here. Uh, I think it's important to just kind of summarize and look, uh, just revisit the, the statements that I included from those studies earlier on. Um, and really that's the mechanical seals may be classified uh, or categorized as a, as a higher percentage of equipment failures. Um, but what we really need to be mindful of is, is the bigger picture. And so there's, uh, there's been a number of the studies I mentioned in, in the past 20 or 30 years that, you know, we, and more established analysis techniques, we, we can see, you know, that we need to look at the bigger picture in terms of overall reliability, not just the focus being on uh, the seal itself being a, perhaps a poor performer, poor design. So uh, one of the tools that we use uh, as mechanical seal suppliers, it's always gonna benefit, um, has been the use of, of finite element analysis and, and even uh, CFD modeling, uh, more advanced, uh, software capability that helps us really kind of determine and, and, and pinpoint some potential flaws in the application. So uh, that's that's a tool we use to help better troubleshoot and provide better analysis, uh, a more accurate analysis of, of, of real life conditions that we experience in the field. Um, liability can also be influenced by new and improved materials, enhanced properties, uh, things, materials would increase corrosion resistance, uh, special alloys and so on, uh, and even new production processes when we talk about seal faces. So specifically improving uh, tribological properties of carbons, carbides, and even using uh, more uh, advanced face treatments like diamond uh, treatment technology, for example, can really help as well uh, improve reliability. But, uh, but at the crux of it, you know, following good practice, uh, and even if you're not following to the letter API 682 or, or good industry standards, but uh, overall having a good method of consistent method of application troubleshooting uh, and implementing as many of these good practices uh, as feasible is ultimately going to be lead to the most success in the long run in terms of reliability of the application and the seal itself.